I think Santa Fe has come a long way from the times when it was a budget brand SUV pick. These days, this model is the flagship of the Hyundai range, offering seven seats and European brand standards of technology and quality. This improved version of the fourth generation model ditches diesel in favor of electrified power plants, and it might well surprise you. The Santa Fe is Hyundai's longest running SUV, part of a crossover lineup of huge importance to this Korean maker. So we were surprised when, in an era of electrification, the original version of this fourth generation TM series model went on sale in 2018, offered only with an old fashioned diesel engine. It didn't really suit its changing market, which is why, only two and a half years later, the brand fundamentally revised this fourth generation design and relaunched it in the form that we're going to look at here. Which of course includes the engine electrification that was originally missing. Uh, quite a lot of it actually. Diesel has been completely ditched and instead the entire range is now based around this compact 1.6 litre petrol turbo engine. Uh, this appears either in the self-charging full hybrid form that we have here or linked to a larger drive battery as part of a plug-in powertrain at the top of the range. Those new engines uh, required an almost entirely new platform, so Hyundai took the opportunity that that offered to improve cabin space a bit and media screen tech, that got an upgrade at the same time. This, along with a few exterior styling changes, uh, will, the brand hopes, help to justify the price hike which has accompanied the introduction of all this new technology. So lots of money has been spent here, reflecting the important role that the Santa Fe plays in a model line that played its part in really establishing this brand in the European market. The very first Santa Fe was launched back in 2001. Uh, that early SM series model was very much a budget brand SUV option. Its second generation successor though, launched uh, five years later, showed that the Korean maker was capable of a great deal more. That CM series design was the first relatively affordable crossover, which blurred the boundaries between the mid-sized class and the large SUV segment that was better suited to bigger families. With it, Santa Fe buyers paid compact sector money, but got the kind of seven seat capacity that they'd previously needed a much larger SUV for. All good. Uh, the third generation uh, NC series model of 2012 built on that success and sold for six years until the original version of this fourth generation TM series design was first launched. And the rest, you know. Like all its predecessors, this current Santa Fe is built on the same engineering found in its close cousin, the Kia Sorento. And it also shares some of the technology used by the Korean maker's new Genesis premium brand with their GV80 model. So. There's the background. Uh, now for the questions that we have to answer here. Will traditional Santa Fe customers who have always chosen the diesel be prepared to switch to electrified petrol power? Does this rejuvenated model's fresh technology really justify its higher price positioning? And will it all be enough to give this car real appeal in what is now quite a crowded sector for D-segment, family-sized seven-seat SUVs? car and driving's test. As usual, the most detailed in the industry will give you some of the answers. The Santa Fe was once a mid-sized SUV, but with every evolution, it's got a little larger, and it certainly feels that way behind the wheel of this one. Traditionally, the bigger the SUV, the more you expected it to deliver the familiar rumble of a diesel engine from beneath the bonnet. Not here though, the Korean maker wants to persuade you uh, that a petrol hybrid powertrain is going forward a better solution, specifically a 1.6 litre sized one. There are two options available in this case. There's a full hybrid self-charging HEV model, which is the one that we have here. Or if you want a full dose of electrification, there's also the option of a pricier plug-in PHEV variant. Hyundai makes much of its latest smart stream petrol powertrain development. Uh, the unit in question here features a combination of direct injection and the company's latest continuously variable valve duration technology. 
but even so, you might have some concerns, as we did in fact, coming into this test, that asking a little 1.6 litre four-cylinder petrol engine to power a two-ton seven-seat family SUV of this kind is somewhat ambitious. Automotive giant Toyota certainly thinks so. Uh, their engineers think that a power plant of 2.5 litres in size is necessary to propel their almost identically sized contender in this class, the Highlander. And that model is only offered as a self-charging petrol hybrid, which, as uh, we mentioned earlier on, is the engine format that we're trying today. You'll need to be clear as to what you're buying here, and it's easy to get confused because the word hybrid is banded about uh, the market liberally right at present. Uh, these days, uh, rival Land Rover Discovery Sport claims to be a hybrid, as do the entry-level petrol and diesel versions of the slightly larger seven-seat family SUVs that you might be considering, like the Volvo XC90 and the Audi Q7. But those cars have engines of the mild hybrid kind, which can't ever run on battery power alone, and therefore can never deliver the really significant efficiency and environmental improvements that you'll probably be looking for here. This Hyundai's HEV power plant isn't like that, as you can feel in town when combustion drive vanishes for much of the time and you're able to just cruise around through the urban sprawl in dignified silence. Might not be quite so impressed out of town though. The HEV system's 1.49 kilowatt hour battery isn't very big and the electric motor it powers has just 60 PS on tap, which when it's combined with a near two ton curb weight can have only one result, a frequent propensity for the 1.6 litre TGDI petrol engine to kick in, sometimes quite vocally, uh, virtually all the time in normal driving. Once it has, uh, should there be a need for more urgent forward thrust, then a prod of the throttle is accompanied by a pleasing stab of initial electrified torque, but that doesn't last for long because there's only 350 newton meters of it to play with. Uh, to give you some perspective, that's about 25% less than you get from a rival Discovery Sport D200 diesel, uh, which is why Santa Fe models are so restricted when it comes to towing capacity. Uh, that's rated at just 1,650 kilos, down from the two and a half tons of the Land Rover or of the previous Santa Fe diesel. With that in mind, it must have been tempting for Hyundai's UK importers to continue to market a version of this car in black pump fueled form, as Kia does with its mechanically almost identical rival Sorento SUV. Or at least use a larger capacity petrol engine, uh, the Toyota Highlander's 2.5 litre hybrid unit enables that car to pull along a couple of tonnes. But the Korean brand has stuck to its guns, uh, maintaining that for everyone other than towers, this 1598cc engine will be quite sufficient for normal motoring. As the stats suggest it will be actually, in every other respect uh, except torque, the figures here are actually pretty similar to those of a Discovery Sport D200 diesel model, uh, the one we just mentioned. A 230 PS total output, an academic 116 miles an hour top speed, and rest to 62 in either 8.9 or 9.1 seconds, depending whether you choose a front driven or, as in this case, a 4x4 powertrain. Unlike the Sorento, which is four-wheel drive only, Hyundai has chosen to give Santa Fe customers a choice of drive formats, although, as usual in this class, even in an all-wheel driven version, you'll be front driven for most of the time. The rear wheels are provided with drive only when absolutely necessary. As we mentioned earlier, the alternative to this HEV hybrid model is a PHEV variant, which can only be had in four-wheel drive form, but which has an even lower 1,350 kilo brake towing capacity. A Santa Fe plug-in makes the same petrol engine with a somewhat gutsier 91 PS electric motor uh, powered by a considerably bigger 13.8 kilowatt hour battery pack. When it's fully charged, this battery is supposed to be able to provide for up to 36 miles of all electric driving and you can get reasonably close to that, uh, after which the 1.6 litre TGDI cuts in with a fraction more vigour thanks to the higher 265 PS combined output. The rest of 62 sprint figure, 8.8 .8 seconds, isn't very much different though because the PHEV system adds an extra 132 kilos of weight. Still, you wouldn't really want to go any faster than that in a car like this, particularly one that handles with a decidedly relaxed gait. This center console drive mode dial has a sport setting which brings a red tinged glow to the instrument display and offers firmer steering, quicker throttle response and faster changes 
from the six-speed automatic transmission. We doubt though that you want to use that setting very much because at speed through tight turns there's really quite a bit of roll although body stability is better than that of the previous model thanks to this fourth generation car's stiffer and more rigid N3 platform. In situations of lateness, you might be a bit more minded to exploit the benefits of that if there was a bit more traction from the uh, Continental Eco Contact 6 tyres. As it is, the car tends to rely heavily on its electronic stability controls and, where fitted, its four-wheel drive system. You're more likely to select one of the two alternative drive modes, Eco or more likely Smart, uh, basically an auto mode which sorts everything out for you, although not ride quality because Hyundai hasn't bothered with adaptive damping for the multi-link rear suspension setup here. Uh, that is a pity because the spring and damping setup uh, that's used here never really settles down quite as much as you might hope it would in such an expensive luxury SUV. German premium brand models do better, but they're not quite as capable as a four-wheel drive version of this Hyundai would be for light off-road excursions. Uh, that drive mode dial that we just mentioned also has a separate terrain section with three extra settings of the sort that you wouldn't have previously seen on a Santa Fe, uh, snow, mud and sand. These adapt the gear shift times and the high track four-wheel drive system to help the car to find and maintain traction on low grip surfaces. And there's also downhill brake control which eases you down slippery slopes. But there's not really enough ride height to venture anywhere too gnarly with this uh, Hyundai uh, and that's evidenced by a set of fairly modest off-road stats, an 18.5 degree approach angle, 21.2 uh, degree departure angle and a 15.7 degree ramp breakover angle. Uh, none of which a typical Santa Fe owner will ever be minded to attempt to replicate. Uh, so the terrain side of the drive mode dial will probably remain largely unused. Of much more interest to likely owners will be Hyundai's latest highway drive assist system and that's standard with top level trim and it's a tentative step towards autonomous driving. Uh, this works with the smart cruise control system to control steering, acceleration and deceleration in your lane while keeping a safe distance from the vehicle ahead and it will automatically control your speed according to the prevailing limits. Uh, this is the sort of technology that once Santa Fe owners could only dream about. Today though, this car can take over driving duties in traffic, it can dip its own headlights, it can prompt you to stop when you're tired, and it can do just about everything else that a current day luxury saloon or estate could offer. Yet, it remains a luxury crossover that unlike some of its premium rivals, always feels ready to lead a hard-working family life. These days, there is a price to pay for that combination of virtues, but the car that you'll get at the end of it now feels, for the first time in the life of this model line, like a properly modern SUV. Over four generations, the Santa Fe has typified an impressive evolution in Hyundai design. In its first generation, it was rather strange and typically Asian. The Mark II model was functional and the Mark III design was quite smart. The original version of this Mark IV Santa Fe had more of an imposing look and this evolved electrified model could actually be described as quite stylish. It's also a bit bigger than the original version of this fourth generation TM series design, although the differences are relatively slight, length having been increased by 15 millimeters and height by seven mils, but that's enough to make this a substantially larger piece of SUV real estate than the rivals that most of the magazines will tell you to consider. This Santa Fe is, for example, 88 millimeters longer than a Skoda Kodiak and 188 mils longer than a Land Rover Discovery Sport. This ensures that this car now takes up a parking space nearly 4.8 meters long, which in size terms isn't that far off a large luxury SUV, say a Volvo XC90 from the next class up. The silhouette here though is a little less stylized and a little boxier than you'll get with an SUV of that sort, although as we'll see later, that's all to the good when it comes to rear seat passenger accommodation. A few styling flourishes attempt to hide some of the bulk, a full length character crease runs from the headlamps to the tail lamps, uh, you get these more sculpted door panels, there are the usual silver roof rails and rounded creases run above the wider wheel arches which house the segment's usual big rims, uh, they're aerodynamic optimized in this instance and sized according to trim at 17 inches or as here 19 inches. 
As for styling changes, while most of those have been made at the front, when this was primarily a 35 to 40,000 pound SUV, which was the case previously, didn't matter too much if the overtaking statement on offer was a touch anonymous, but repositioned in a higher price bracket, this car has to now appeal against premium brands, which means the need for a great deal more pavement presence. Uh, you'll be the judge as to whether Hyundai has delivered that. There's a much bigger 3D mesh pattern grill that flows into large larger LED headlamps, which have uh, separate narrow daytime running light strips above and slim angled corner cutouts below. Uh, plus, lower silver skid plate trim now encompasses the entire lower grille section. The rear is less eye-catching but equally confidently executed, the main change being the addition of this full-width light strip, which emphasises the model's uh, 10mm increase in width and links the LED lamp clusters. Uh, this lower diffuser section has been heavily revised too. It's far less fussy, with the exhausts and rear reflectors more smoothly integrated than before. As usual though, what's of greater importance is the stuff that you can't see. Now this was the first model in the Hyundai lineup to adopt the brand's so-called third generation architecture, a platform designed for powertrain electrification and one which already underpins the company's US market Sonata Saloon. Time to take a seat at the wheel. The door opens wide to ease entry. Once inside, you'll find that Hyundai has, to a great extent, achieved the ambiance of luxury design, which the original version of the Mark IV model tilted at, but never quite delivered. The centre console has been raised, which gives far more of a cocooned aircraft cockpit-style feel, and on it, gear shift buttons replace the previous traditional selector stick. The central infotainment screen at the top of the centre stack here is far larger, now with a panoramic style feel. And if you opt for this top spec variant to suit the current segment Vogue, you'll get a big virtual instrument cluster, uh, which replaces the traditional analogue gauges. There's a properly commanding high set SUV seating position from which you view cabin quality, which has taken a noticeable step forward with this model line in recent years, although it isn't yet quite at premium brand levels. Still, Hyundai has been trying hard in this regard. All models get leather upholstery with handcrafted upper backrest quilting. And other finishing touches include a faux leather wrapped uh, dash covering with white double stitching, uh, silver carbon fibre style trimming panels all around the door pulls and on the centre console here. Uh, these smart textured door speakers and nice use of silver brightwork around the fascia. It's all enough to make the cabin of this car's uh, identically engineered cousin, of course, the Kia Sorento, feel a bit utilitarian, but it probably won't tempt you out of your BMW, your Audi or your Volvo. There are some really nice little media and technology touches though that you won't find with brands like those. Let's start with the driver's supervision instrument cluster screen. You view through this uh, three-spoke stitched leather steering wheel. This constitutes merely a little 4.2 inch central display between the conventional gauges with the base premium model. Uh, this top ultimate variant though gets the full 12.3 inch version of that screen with virtual dials, a speeder on the left and a hybrid system indicator on the right. Uh, those are replaced by little rear view camera screens every time you put the indicators on uh, one way or the other. Uh, we can't recall seeing that useful little feature on any other car. Hyundai hasn't figured out how to incorporate full screen mapping into a display of this kind. So between the gauges above an economy to readout band is a central information readout section. You can format to show an energy flow monitor, trip computer data, a digital speedo and a tension level indicator, the prevailing speed limit, tyre pressures, a compass or the tractional status of the four wheel drive system. So quite a lot then. Anything this screen can't tell you will probably be covered off by the central 10.25 inch touchscreen satellite navigation display, a big improvement on the previous 7 or 8 inch monitors. If Hyundai wants to tilt at prestige brands though, it needs to develop a properly responsive voice activation system for its MediaTek. That's lacking here, but in compensation, alongside the usual Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone mirroring and navigational features, even the entry-level model gets a properly high-quality Krell 10-speaker premium audio system. And there are more thoughtful little touches uh, that you might really appreciate here. Uh, take, for example, the passenger talk feature. Now, this 
provides a front microphone to pick up and to amplify the driver's voice, playing it back to uh, rear seat folk through the rear speakers. Uh, then there's the quiet mode feature, which cuts off all the rear speakers and keeps the uh, volume of the front ones down to a preset level. That's very handy for when children are sleeping in the back seats, yet you don't want to miss out on that song or that bit of news you were listening to. There's also an intriguing screen section Hyundai calls Sounds of Motion, which is a bit like one of those apps you can get that help to send you to sleep at night. Uh, this feature is, of course, intended to have the opposite effect via six different options. Lively forest, calm ocean waves and snowy village. They're all quite soothing, but we can't really understand why on earth you'd want rainy day or open air cafe. The latter is complete with people shouting and congested traffic noises. Or indeed, warm fireplace, which creates the rather unnerving impression that something in the uh, engine bay up front has ignited. Uh, swipe around the other parts of this big central display and you'll find a Hyundai Live section, which can brief you on traffic flow and filling station info on your journey, uh, along with parking info too for your destination. And there's also the brand's latest Blue Link connectivity, offering a section with calendar, weather and vehicle diagnostics menus. Enough on MediaTek, what else might you need to know here? Well, build quality, that seems pretty solid, uh, but you might not like the switch to big buttons for the gear shift mechanism, or the way the designers haven't bothered to follow the current trend away from physical buttons. Uh, this higher centre console is festooned in them, uh, in various uh, shapes and sizes too. There's lots of adjustment for both the wheel and these very comfortable seats here, which come with lumbar support, heating and powered adjustment. Plus on this top variant here, memory settings with cooled ventilation too. All round vision, well, your view frontwards is easy. That's thanks to the commanding driving position here and also the relative slimness of these front A pillars, even though they incorporate these neat little vents. Rearward visibility, though, uh, as usual in any seven-seater, will be rather more problematic, particularly if you have a car full of passengers. But, as you'd expect for the price here, all-round parking sensors and a rear-view camera come included, and you also get a surround-view monitor on this top variant. What about storage space? Well, this raised centre console eliminates the big storage cubby that most rivals offer at the base of the centre stack. But in compensation, you get this stowage area just underneath here, which is complete with a USB socket and a 12 volt port. There's also this deep lidded box further back between the seats, which gets a pull out tray, but doesn't incorporate any connectivity points. If you're looking for a USB port, you'll find it in this small lidded cubby below the gear shift buttons, which also includes a cup holder. A further cup holder sits just behind with a square compartment here that includes a wireless charging mat alongside that. A narrow but smartly illuminated storage cubby sits just above the uh, rather cheap feeling glove box that can be chilled to keep things like chocolate and drinks cool, but it is mainly taken up by the handbook and it really isn't as big as it looks. The door bins aren't very large either. Each of them incorporates a bottle holder. You get ticket clips in the sun visors, but Hyundai has forgotten to add an overhead sunglasses compartment. Access to the middle row seating is good. Again, the doors open widely and that makes it easy for parents to lean in and attach things like child seats and booster cushions. Once you get comfortable in the second row, there's a slightly greater feeling of space than was the case with the previous version of this model. That's not an illusion either. Hyundai says that the legroom in this part of the car has been increased by 34 millimeters as part of the changes made here. Although the actual amount of space that you get will depend of course on the way that you position this sliding seat base, which can be moved backwards and forwards across the 300 millimeter range. Uh, the extent to which you'll be able to do that though, will of course be determined by whether you're in front of third row folk uh, traveling behind you. Uh, there is a notably low central transmission tunnel and that'll make it uh, easier to transport a third adult in this rather narrow central seating position should the need arise. A headroom that isn't overly generous, especially with this large glass panoramic roof fitted, but taller folk will be able to feel rather more comfortable if they're able to make use of the reclining seat backs here. Uh, that glass roof is worth having though. It offers this rather darkly furnished cabin a lighter and airier feel. 
What else? Well, the kids will be pleased to find that twin USB ports are provided back here so phones can be charged while gaming equipment buzzes and beeps away, uh, probably annoying parents in the front. Uh, with all models, uh, the rear bench is heated and on this top spec variant, you get side window blinds too. Uh, that compensates a bit for the fact that Hyundai doesn't provide climate controls for second row folk, only these twin central vents. Um, as for storage, well, there are the usual twin cup holders in this fold-down armrest. Uh, there are seat-back pockets, and the door bins are of a reasonable size, and they incorporate little bottle holders. OK, time to check out the third row. It's a bit of a pity, though, that you can only access the third row from the curb side of the car. You have to have three rows with this fourth-generation Santa Fe, and that will be pleasing to hear for those family folk who are interested in the plug-in version of this model. Quite a few PHEV rivals in this segment are five seat only. You get electric operation to move the second row seat forward in a way which will enable you to gain access to the very rear of the vehicle. You just press this button here on the seat shoulder. Now unfortunately uh, doing that doesn't tumble the seat, it merely slides it forward and it doesn't actually do even that to any great extent unless the front passenger seat is pushed quite a way towards the windscreen. Uh, this combined with the high floor height here means you'll need to be fairly athletic to gain access to the very rear. Once you're in, there is, as advertised, more room than you'd usually get in the rearmost pews of a typical D-segment seven-seat SUV, and that's thanks to the extra body length that we referred to earlier on. It's freed up just enough room to more comfortably accommodate the uh, couple of full-sized adults who would uh, have been significantly more cramped in the previous generation versions of this car, or at least uh, that will be the case if the second row folk just ahead of you have pushed their seat bases forward by a reasonable amount. Uh, if they haven't, then it really will feel really quite claustrophobic back here. Don't get us wrong, you won't be as comfortable back here as you would be in the very rear of a Galaxy or Charan-like large people carrier. There's certainly not enough headroom for that, but by SUV standards, it's really quite spacious back here. Uh, you will be noticeably more constricted in the very back of a Land Rover Discovery Sport, and even an Audi Q7 costing up to £10,000 more isn't noticeably roomier in this regard. Third row folk get their own air conditioning vents, plus a trinket tray and a cup holder each. And there's even a fan controller for the right-hand occupant and a 12-volt socket. But these angled D-pillar uh, windows can make it feel a bit claustrophobic at times. And we're also disappointed that, like many rivals, Hyundai hasn't fitted Isofix charge seat fastenings back here. Of course, with those rearmost seats in place, there won't be much room for luggage, but then that is true of any seven-seater which isn't directly based on a van. Uh, lift the powered tailgate and you'll find that with all three rows in place, you'll only have enough space for a few shopping bags. Still, there is a bit more room to the left of the underfloor compartment, uh, plus there's space for the detachable tow bar, if that's fitted. But the hybrid battery system packaging robs this area of the previous model's useful capability of being able to store the tonneau cover down there when that's not in use. Uh, there's no proper space saver spare wheel either, even though if you look under the rear of the car, space is provided for it. So in the event of a puncture, you'll be stuck by the side of the road fiddling with a tyre inflation kit. Most of the time you're probably going to be using your Santa Fe though with these third row chairs folded into the floor which frees up a total of 634 litres of space. That's enough for 10 carry-on suitcases and it's 87 litres more than the original version of this fourth generation design could offer. And you can eke out a bit more than that if you're prepared to annoy any second row passengers by making their seat backrests a bit more upright or by sliding their seat bases forward. Uh, the boot opening is nice and wide and it has a low loading lip, so awkward things like push chairs and bikes should go in with ease. The cargo area itself is decently shaped too, although it is a bit inhibited by wheel arches which protrude slightly into the back of the boot. 
completely flatten the central bench and 1,625 litres of fresh air can be freed up. That's much the same as before. The load area is flat until the middle row of seats, at which point it rises slightly. To give you some class perspective, the total capacity figure uh, just quoted is quite a lot less than you get in something like a Skoda Kodiak, but similar to what you could expect from, say, a Land Rover Discovery Sport. Uh, there's no option for a fold-flat front passenger seat, but what's provided here should be quite sufficient for the needs of likely buyers. Electrified technology is expensive, as we've realised after taking a look at the price list for this significantly updated fourth generation Santa Fe. When we first tested this Mark IV model in its original diesel form in 2018, not that long ago, prices started at around £34,000. From the launch of this electrified version, though, in early 2021, the starting figure for an HEV hybrid like the one we have here had risen to just over £40,000 for the base front-driven derivative with an extra £2,280 uh, for those wanting four-wheel drive. That's for the base premium level of trim. You'll need to add just over £3,500 more to each of those figures if you want the plusher ultimate level of spec we're trying today, which, with four-wheel drive included, will take you up to around £46,000 for a Santa Fe like the one we have here. That sort of money would be enough to get you a lesser version of the alternative plug-in petrol model, which is offered only with four-wheel drive and was priced from launch from just over £45,000 with base premium trim. You'll need around £49,000 for a plusher variant with top ultimate spec. Hyundai isn't shy about charging these days then, but at least those asking figures do get you the third seating row that quite a few plug-in luxury SUVs make you do without. All Santa Fe's are these days sold as seven-seaters and all get the same six-speed automatic gearbox. Unlike with this car's identically engineered cousin, the Kia Sorento, there's no option of having a diesel engine. That Kia can only be had with four-wheel drive and at the time of this test, in summer 2021, it cost around £39,000 for an HEV model with base two-spec trim or around £43,500 with mid-range three-spec. If you're making comparisons, you'll need to know that the equivalent tally of a base Santa Fe HEV model with premium spec falls somewhere between those two Kia trim levels. And that makes the asking price of the entry point Santa Fe HEV premium uh, around £42,500 at the time of this test look quite reasonable, especially as this Hyundai feels slightly more upmarket inside. What about rivals from other brands? Well, size-wise, the Santa Fe is positioned halfway between the mid-sized and the large-sized SUV segments, or if it makes more sense, midway between the relative affordability of the Land Rover Discovery Sport and the luxury of a Land Rover Discovery. Uh, since this Hyundai's traditional market has been against the more affordable D-segment, mainstream branded seven-seat family SUVs uh, will concentrate mainly on alternative options there since these are the kinds of cars that most likely customers will also be considering. Let's start with the Discovery Sport since we happen to have mentioned that model. Uh, we've pointed out elsewhere in this film that that is a slightly smaller car and that in its mainstream forms it offers mild hybrid rather than more efficient full hybrid engine tech. Despite that, the kind of D200 diesel disco sport model that you'd need to comparably compete against a Santa Fe uh, HEV hybrid costs much the same. And the Discovery Sport P300e PHEV costs around £2,500 more than a Santa Fe plug-in hybrid, despite the fact that it can't offer seven seats. Hyundai isn't alone in chasing that Land Rover in this class. The Volkswagen Group has three uh, family-sized D-segment seven-seat SUVs, which feature similar engineering to that that you'll find in a Desco Sport, all of them recently revised. There's the Volkswagen Tiguan Allspace, uh, the Seat Taraco, and the Skoda Kodiak. At first glance, this trio all looks significantly cheaper than this Hyundai, but that's because entry-level versions get feebler engines than this Santa Fe uses, with a 200 PS engine that's comparably powerful to the one that's used in this Hyundai. A Kodiak or a Taraco might save you £4,000 or so, a Tiguan Allspace rather less than that but the difference would probably narrow quite a bit if you equalised spec to Hyundai levels. Plus, you'd have to have a diesel with the Volkswagen, the Seat and the Skoda. Uh, there's no full hybrid petrol option to rival a Santa Fe HEV. 
And although you can get PHEV versions of the Turaco, those variants are difficult to compare to a slightly pricier Santa Fe plug-in hybrid because A, they're less powerful, and perhaps more significantly B, they can't be had with the third seating row that you can get with the plug-in version of this Hyundai. In the seven-seat SUV D segment, you might want to consider the Peugeot 5008. It's a lot cheaper than this Hyundai, but at the time of this test, Peugeot wasn't offering that car with any hybrid powertrains, and it also lacks any kind of four-wheel drive system. A tough go-anywhere four-wheel drive setup is a calling card of the budget choice in this segment. That's the Sangyong Rexton. That certainly matches this Hyundai for physical stature and it offers impressive towing capability but there's no kind of engine electrification on offer and there's a relatively inefficient diesel power plant up front. If you're looking at a top-end Santa Fe HEV variant like this one and you can afford a bit more, much the same kind of self-charging hybrid recipe can be served up by the Toyota Highlander which has a similar but bigger capacity power plant. One of those, though, costs from around, uh, well, just over £50,000. And by the time you're paying that kind of money, you could be looking at base versions of premium badged SUVs in the luxury segment for slightly larger models that we referenced earlier on. Cars like the Volvo XC90, the Audi Q7, and the full-sized Land Rover Discovery. Uh, you would have to compromise on engine electrification to choose one of those models, though. Uh, they only come with mild hybrid tech in their rather more affordable forms, which, uh, as we've been saying all along, is nothing like as efficient as the fully electrified engineering that you'll get in a petrol Santa Fe. If, having considered all that, you conclude it is a Santa Fe that takes your interest, then you're going to need to know just how generous Hyundai has been with the standard spec here. So, let's take a look at that now. As well as all the features we've mentioned already, uh, seven seats and auto transmission, all models include full LED headlights, roof rails, front fog lights, smart adaptive speed control, cruise control with stop and go functionality, Hyundai's terrain mode select driving mode system, all round parking sensors, self leveling suspension, uh, keyless entry, a powered tailgate and an alarm, plus a wide range of camera safety features that we'll brief you on in just a moment. Standard cabin items include leather upholstery, a properly high quality Krell 10 speaker premium audio system, heat for the front seats and the steering wheel, and also dual zone climate control with air conditioning for the third row of seats too. You can also tick off an auto dimming rear view mirror, uh, a reversing camera, there's a wireless phone charging pad, and there's also heated rear seats. Features specific to the base premium trim level include 17-inch alloy wheels, although you get bigger 19-inch rims with premium spec if you go for the plug-in hybrid drivetrain. Uh, that is the same as with the Kia Sorento we referenced earlier. Hyundai, though, has taken a slightly different approach to Kia in terms of its screen tech, uh, whereas the base Sorentos get a big instrument cluster screen, but a small display one for the center stack. With the Santa Fe, uh, it's the other way around. Uh, most buyers, we think, will prefer that because it means that you get built-in navigation right across the Santa Fe range rather than having to avoid base spec to get it, as is the case with the Kia Sorento. That GPS system works on a 10.25-inch screen, which includes Hyundai's map care and live traffic services. Plus, there's also the usual Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone integration services. Uh, and there's also a Blue Link connectivity section, and that offers a calendar, weather, and vehicle diagnostics menus. Does it matter that unless you stretch uh, further up, the Santa Fe range, you only get a small 4.2-inch driver's supervision instrument cluster. Uh, well, we don't really believe that many customers will think so. But of course, if you're wanting a luxury SUV fitted out with that kind of equipment that you get on a full executive segment saloon, those are the kinds of upmarket features that you're going to want, in which case your dealer will direct you instead towards the ultimate level of spec that we've been trying here today. Uh, with this, the larger 19-inch wheel size is standardized for the HEV drivetrain, and you get an enormous panoramic glass sunroof, along with a standard of cabin media tech, which includes a 12.3-inch driver's supervision instrument cluster screen, and that can be customized with individual drive mode layouts and various uh, informational features. 
Uh, other ultimate spec features include a head-up display, uh, there's cooled ventilation for the front seats, there are memory settings for the driver's chair, chromed door handle inserts, uh, a surround view camera system, rear side window blinds and some extra drive assist safety and autonomous driving features that we'll cover off in just a moment. Uh, perhaps the cleverest ultimate spec feature though is remote smart parking assist. Now this will allow you to remotely park your Santa Fe even when you're not in it. Uh, if say you're trying to reverse into a very tight garage bay where it'll be difficult to get out once you turn the engine off, uh, you can manoeuvre the car from up to four metres away by using the key fob. It's brilliant. Unlike many of its rivals, Hyundai doesn't offer a huge range of options, but you will have to pay more for your chosen paint colour because all the different pearl metallic shades available cost extra. We've got metallic Typhoon Silver here uh, with top ultimate spec, you'll be offered the chance to pay £2,000 more for the extra cost luxury pack and that gives you softer Nappa leather interior trim, a suede headliner, brushed aluminium centre console accents and a faux leather wrap dashboard. And of course across the range you can add in the usual practical extras like a retractable tow bar and the cross roof bars that allow you to add in a roof box, a bike carrier or carriers for skis and snowboards. On to safety. As you'd expect, there's a decent package of camera safety kit, starting with the usual autonomous braking system. Hyundai's been called Forward Collision Avoidance Assist, a setup that detects pedestrians, cyclists and other vehicles in close proximity, and also oncoming traffic when you're making a turn at a junction. Uh, there's also an LKAS, Lane Departure Warning System, with Lane Keep Assist, which applies subtle steering lock if you drift out of your lane, and a clever Lane Follow Assist setup that works with the smart adaptive speed control cruise control system we mentioned earlier on. So it can take over driving duties from you in heavy traffic, controlling acceleration, braking and steering, depending on the movements of the vehicle in front. So in a queue, uh, when the vehicle in front of you moves off, so will you. Uh, there's also intelligent speed limit warning, uh, which uses a camera to read speed limit signs along the road and then displays them for you uh, beside the speedometer and on the navigation screen too. You can then decide to set your speed to the road speed limit or you can override it. Hyundai has also specifically thought about the safety of rear seat passengers. Safe exit assist detects vehicles approaching from behind, sounding a warning and locking the door to stop an occupant accidentally opening the door in the face of an oncoming vehicle. Another clever safety feature we particularly like is rear occupancy alert, which monitors the rear seats using an ultrasonic sensor which helps to detect the movements of children. Uh, the system first reminds drivers to check the rear seats when they're exiting the vehicle uh, with a message on the central instrument cluster display. If the system detects movement in the rear seats after the driver has left his or her Santa Fe, it'll honk the horn, flash the lights and send a Blue Link alert to the driver's smartphone via the Blue Link connected car system. Believe it or not, tragedies have occurred where children have accidentally locked themselves in the car or parents have locked children in hot vehicles. Horrifically, in the US alone, more than 800 children have died from heat-related illnesses in vehicles since 1994. And in 55% of those cases, the parent was apparently unaware that the child was even in the vehicle. On a really hot day, experts say that it only takes a matter of minutes before the heat can overwhelm a child's ability to regulate his or her internal temperature. And their core temperature can increase three to five times faster than that of an adult. So that's all good. What else? Uh, well, the LED headlights are clever with smart high beam, which automatically dips them at night, and the dynamic bending feature so that they turn with the corners at night. Uh, there's also a multi-collision brake assist, which works after an impact, breaking the car so it's less likely to go on and hit something else. Uh, there's also a driver attention warning feature, which monitors your reactions for drowsiness. And of course, all Santa Fe's come equipped with front and side airbags, as well as curtain airbags and a central bag in the dashboard. There's also auto door unlocking in the event of an impact, as well as ABS braking and electronic stability control to help you avoid one in the first place. 
An e-call system will alert the emergency services with your GPS location if the airbags go off in an accident. And if you have a tow bar fitted, the car will activate a trailer stability assist system that will stop trailer snaking. For off-road terrain, there's downhill brake control, where the vehicle brakes operate automatically to stabilise the car on a steep descent. If you want a bit more autonomous driving tech, this top ultimate spec includes Hyundai's Highway Drive Assist system, which maintains the speed set by the driver or the speed limit of the motorway. At the same time, it controls steering, acceleration and deceleration in your lane while keeping a safe distance from the vehicle ahead. Uh, this feature is also designed to automatically adjust your speed based on the speed limit of the road detected uh, through the navigation system. So if you have the speed set at 70 miles an hour on a motorway and the limit changes to 50, the car will automatically lower the speed to suit. Top spec ultimate trim also adds three further features. There's a blind spot view monitor, which uh, stops you from dangerously pulling out in front of oncoming vehicles. You get a parking collision avoidance assist reverse system, which at low speeds uses the rear view camera and parking sensors to detect obstacles that you may not have seen. Uh, for example, a pedestrian walking behind you or a low wall, and it automatically applies the brakes to avoid an impact if you don't respond to the warnings. Uh, to complete things here, we'll also brief you on the ultimate spec package's RCTA, uh, that's Rear Cross Traffic Alert, and that alerts you to oncoming vehicles when you're reversing out of a space. It's all very reassuring. It's difficult to imagine a customer of any previous generation Santa Fe choosing this model with a petrol engine, uh, much less one uh, just 1.6 litres in size. Yet with diesel fuel falling out of favour, that's exactly what Hyundai is now asking customers to do. Uh, thankfully, the inclusion of a turbocharger and quite a bit of hybrid electrification helps the transition. We covered just how much electrification you get in our driving experience section, quite a bit as it turns out, and a lot more than is offered by the so-called mild hybrids in this segment uh, from brands like Land Rover, engines which can't ever independently drive the car on battery power alone. The HEV self-charging unit fitted to the hybrid petrol model we're trying here, the one Hyundai expects most Santa Fe customers to choose, can certainly do that although not for very long thanks to the combination of a near two-ton curb weight, a relatively feeble 60 PS electric motor and the small size of the 1.49 kWh lithium-ion polymer battery pack. Still, this four-wheel drive HEV model's 40.4 miles per gallon WLTP rated combined cycle fuel showing is pretty much the same as you get from an equivalently powerful diesel version of a direct rival. Uh, as in the case of the Land Rover Discovery Sport, even a mild hybrid embellished one. Uh, and you can improve that figure to 44.1 mpg if you opt for the cheaper front-driven two-wheel drive version. As for the Santa Fe self-charging model's CO2 readings, uh, they're WLTP rated at either 159 grams per kilometre for the four-wheel drive model or 145 grams per kilometre for the two-wheel drive, uh, readings that also match those uh, black pump-fueled SUVs and you'll be running on cheaper fuel, so that's all good. But not quite as good, of course, as the returns you'll get if you stump up the considerable amount extra that Hyundai wants for the plug-in version of this model. Uh, this four-wheel drive variant can be charged from a three-pin 2.2 kilowatt supply in five hours and two minutes, empty to 100%. Use the 3.3 kilowatt AC supply, and that time drops to three hours and 25 minutes. As we said in our driving section, the fact that the Santa Fe plug-in has a larger 91 PS electric motor powered by a considerably larger 13.8 kilowatt hour battery makes all the difference. And it gives you the usual PHEV three-figure combined economy reading, in this case 173.7 miles per gallon, along with an enviro-conscious CO2 figure of just 37 grams per kilometre which in turn makes possible a super low benefit in kind taxation rating of just 10% for both spec levels. This HEV self-charging hybrid can't of course get anywhere near to that in reducing a tax bill. It's BIK rated at 32% in two-wheel drive premium form, 34% in premium four-wheel drive guys, 34% uh, as well in top spec ultimate two-wheel drive form, and 36% if you go for this ultimate four-wheel drive model. 
whatever Santa Fe drivetrain and power plant you choose, to help you get somewhere close to the quoted fuel figures, you'll have to keep this Hyundai as regularly as possible in its eco drive mode. Uh, this slightly restricts throttle travel and the climate system output. In the plug-in hybrid model, if the battery is charged, you can also switch to full electric mode and that allows the car to travel up to 36 miles on battery power alone, a range potential that we've found to be surprisingly achievable actually. Hyundai suggests that by sticking to an urban environment, you could actually see that figure climb to a very reasonable 43 miles uh, before the engine has to cut in. On to VED road tax, again there are big advantages here with hybrid drive. For this HEV hybrid you'll pay £545 in year one. Uh, to give you some perspective, a Kia Sorento CRDI diesel uh, would cost £895 uh, in VED for the same period. Choose a Santa Fe plug-in hybrid and in year one of ownership you won't have to make any VED payments at all. Bear in mind that uh, any car that costs more than £40,000, as all Santa Fe models now do, is liable for an additional £335 payment for the first five years the tax is renewed. Uh, you'll also want to know about likely depreciation uh, with a volume brand badged large SUV of this kind of price. Well, it's reasonably class competitive, think around 55%. A big draw with any new Hyundai is the comprehensive five-year unlimited mileage warranty package that comes along with it, which shows the faith and confidence that the company has in its products. Uh, that's backed up by a breakdown cover that lasts for the same length of time and also free annual vehicle health checks over the duration. Now true, rival brand Kia claims to better the package by offering a similar seven-year deal, but there you're limited to 100,000 miles. Uh, there is also a 12-year anti-perforation guarantee and a 5-year paint warranty to even further cement the longevity of the car. Servicing is every 10,000 miles on the two petrol hybrids. Uh, should those mileages not be achieved, then servicing is still required annually. Uh, if you want to budget ahead for routine maintenance, there are various Hyundai Sense packages uh, which offer fixed price servicing over two, three or five-year periods. You can pay for your plan monthly and you can add MOTs into the three or five year plans for an extra cost. Uh, usefully, the Blue Link section of the 10.2 5 inch center screen has a vehicle diagnostic section and that allows you to check various maintenance functions uh, between services. I'm um, thinking about the brakes, the indicators, uh, the steering, uh, the camera safety systems, and the tire pressures too. Insurance ratings are, for some reason, considerably lower than they are on a comparable Kia Sorento. Uh, for this HEV self-charging hybrid, they start at Group 22E for a two-wheel drive model with base premium trim, and they rise to Group 23E for the same car with four-wheel drive. It's also Group 23E for a top-spec Ultimate HEV hybrid model if you order that with two-wheel drive, or Group 24E uh, if you get the Ultimate spec four-wheel drive model that we're trying here. If you choose a plug-in hybrid, it's 26E with premium trim or 27E with ultimate spec. The fourth generation Hyundai Santa Fe has improved significantly in this electrified form. Its predecessor was a convincing contender, which now looks like a great used buy, but this car has added an extra layer of polish. It looks classy, it's really well built, it rides and handles exactly as it should, and it's cleverly thought through inside. As a result, it's almost impossible to dislike, even if SUVs really aren't your thing. But then you could say that about quite a few cars in this class. For sure, if we'd had this package back at this Mark IV model's original launch in 2018, it would have been a class leader, but that was then. In the here and now, there's every chance of this Santa Fe model's appeal getting crowded out by segment noise and potential customers missing just what a very complete package this car really is. Which would be a pity because you could make an argument for segment leadership here, although that would be easier if the drive experience wasn't quite so remote and the price sticker wasn't quite so high. Apart from that though, as we've been saying, there's lots to like here. This hybridized Santa Fe isn't showy or pretentious. Instead, it marries all the best bits of models of this kind, namely their space, versatility, and ease of ownership with the refreshing lack of drama of a normal big family car. And it is big. I mean, do you really need a larger SUV than this? 
There are a few issues, of course. If you habitually tow heavy loads, then this car's new era hybrid powertrains won't suit you at all. Other rivals are also better either on or off-road, and the identically engineered Kia Sorento can be slightly cheaper. For all that, we can see a definite appeal here for someone who wants the space of a large SUV, but needs to stay somewhere near the price bracket of a mid-sized model. If you've got a growing family, you have room in your life for just a single car, and you need one that's stylish, practical, uh, reflects the current trend for electrification, and will discreetly go the distance without a hiccup, then it's well worth trying one of these. Do that, and who knows, you might once again start to believe in Santa.